Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We're going to explore the shadow side of ayahuasca today. With me is Dr. Rachel Harris, who is the author of Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. Dr. Harris is a psychologist. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Jeffrey. Pleasure to be with you again. As a psychologist, <laughs> uh, we're always interested in the shadow side yes, absolutely. of human relationships. That's where growth really occurs is when people begin to confront their own shadow, their own darkness, their fears in particular, their propensities for anger and lust and the, the whole negative side yes. of, of human experience is uh, very, very fertile ground for, for growth of a psychological nature. Uh, and that's true well, with or without uh, psychedelic drugs. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, in, in writing this book, I, one of the writings that I relied <clears throat> on was Anne Shulgin's. She's um, mm -hmm. the wife of Sasha Shulgin. And, oh, yes. And before um, ecstasy or MDMA became illegal, mm -hmm. she was a lay psychotherapist using MDMA. Mm -hmm. But she's uh, she's now in her 80s. Yes. She was an, a natural therapist, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, she had just a, like a five-page paper, but it really captured sort of the value of, of this kind of psychotherapy. And I think she called it maybe encountering the shadow or mm -hmm. something like that. And one of her warnings that was really interesting was, unless the therapist has really worked with their own shadow and found a way to live with it and accept it and be in relationship to the therapist's own shadow, then they have no business working in this area where in any of the psychedelics, the shadow arises. Mm -hmm. And if the therapist has not done their own work, they really cannot work with a, a client encountering their shadow. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was, that was, she had some very important therapeutic wisdoms to share, and that was one of them. Well, when we talk about the shadow side of ayahuasca, part of that is, of course, people encountering their own shadow yes. is, is, is part of, you know, turning the microscope inward, right. uh, so to speak. Uh, but there are also other uh, things that the shadow side of ayahuasca might refer to. Yes, absolutely. There are real risks, and uh, <clears throat> Not every shaman, I mean, the, the some shaman who supposedly, if they have not completed their training, mm -hmm. which can go on for at least seven to 20 years, I mean, it goes on forever, mm -hmm. um, they can be a uh, brujo, a witch, basically, yeah. which means that they have attained some powers using ayahuasca and other medicines, but they use them for their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, there have been reports of rapes in, in retreat centers in, yeah. in Peru, uh, where people have been, ba I mean, it's sort of an old story. Uh, the shaman mixed in uh, datura, or toe, into the ayahuasca mixture, and that is a, a, a dissociative drug. Mm -hmm. And women get sort of knocked out, and they don't kind of know what's happening to them. It can be a them. poison. It can be a poison. It's a very dangerous drug, and it practically functions like a rape drug. Mm -hmm. And so, women have been raped during these ayahuasca retreats. Mm -hmm. So that there is always that shadow side to a so-called spiritual teacher, or shaman don't even say that they're a spiritual teacher, but anyone that someone is following for spiritual purposes, um, there can always be that risk. Whether it's about money or sex or power, mm -hmm. there's always that shadow side. Mm -hmm. And an another potential risk that you refer to is cultural appropriation. Now that so many Westerners are traveling into the Amazon region, or shamans are coming up from the Amazon, or Westerners are uh, purporting to be shamans or have been initiated right. as shamans, you have this cultural fusion taking place. Right. I saw an ad where you can go to a retreat mm -hmm. center in Peru in six weeks and train to be a shaman. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> 
you know, the shaman who, who I know, it's decades of training. Yeah. So to say you can do this in six weeks is a good example of cultural appropriation. To a certain extent, I have to say that using this medicine for therapeutic purposes could also be considered cultural appropriation. I mean, the therapeutic purposes are clearly defined in a Western culture, and that's not uh, the the indigenous use of this medicine exactly, because they don't see things the same way. They see any disturbances or um, symptoms as a, a soul problem, that there's a spiritual problem that needs to be cured, which is a very different perspective than a Western psychotherapeutic one. Mm -hmm. So I'm also stretching the way the medicine can yeah. be used. Well, to begin with, for the most part, as I understand it, uh, ayahuasca, unlike other psychedelics, is pretty much always uh, taken in a ritual context. Yes, yes. It certainly is not going to be a recreational substance mm -hmm. um, because it's just too uncomfortable and not fun and people need a bathroom very close by. So people are not going to do this at raves or, or music festivals where yeah. bathrooms are few and far between. So so some of the risks entail, you know, is has the ritual been properly prepared? And uh, You know, this is really an important <clears throat> question. I write in the book about the importance of the songs that the shaman sings. Mm -hmm. They're called Icaros. And from an indigenous perspective, these songs are also the medicine. Mm -hmm. And and it's been said that if you really know the songs, you don't even have to drink the medicine. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, you know, I had somebody talk about a ceremony where they were, and I said, and who who was the shaman for the ceremony? Well, we didn't really have a shaman. We sort of had a DJ. He played music. Yeah. And I sort of want to tear my hair out. Mm -hmm. That's only... A, a part of what a legitimate ceremony is. Mm -hmm. So they're missing all these other worlds mm -hmm. that come together to make a full ritual. And I think we, uh, in the West, we would do well to really respect the the, the wholeness of this ritual. Mm -hmm. But I th already we're not doing a good job at that because people can make money uh, leading ceremonies, and so that's always a problem. Well, and, and that's part of our, our Western the model. West, we're, yes, the Western we're model. The business uh, model. Yes, that, the entrepreneurs. Uh, entrepreneurs, <laughs> exa exactly, which yeah. uh, I had many years ago an ayahuasca experience here in Nevada, and it, it was like that. There was a, a Western uh, representative of the Santo Daime Church who, mm -hmm. who had a tape and played music oh. during the experience. Uh -huh. I, my experience was completely positive, but I had no desire to return. Uh, right. Uh, you know, once was enough. Yes, I understand <laughs> completely. And um, it seems as if that that's where we're taking something which is sacred to the, to the natives who develop this uh, tradition, and we introduce money, we introduce uh, the idea of uh, people gathering in a social context. And oh dear. Well, I, I really want to um, pay respect mm -hmm. to the integrity of a, a ritual ceremony yeah. where the shaman is really trained and they they choose what songs to sing depending on what's happening in the room. Mm -hmm. they, they're sort of like a traffic controller. Yeah. They can see and sense what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, even though everybody's sitting in the dark and is still and quiet, yeah. they can, I, I've experienced it, that they can direct songs to specific people mm -hmm. um, and, and offer help through the singing. And it's it's really uh, I hate to see the rituals become less than it can possibly be. Yeah. Uh, and the artwork too, they are also embodiments of the medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the art, I mean, you get a sense of how the culture is fits together with this medicine, so that everything comes together in a ritual. And I, I don't want us to lose that experience of the wholeness of a ritual. Mm -hmm. But simply by bringing ayahuasca out of the jungle and yes. in, taking it to North America, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, today, this very day, there are maybe a, a thousand different uh, ceremonies in North America involving yeah. ayahuasca. That could be the case. So it's 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 out. It's out. 
Right. The genie is out of the bottle. Exactly. So maybe all mm -hmm. I can do is say there is a wholeness mm -hmm. to the ceremony that we should at least know about and respect yeah. because there is no control over who's leading ceremonies mm -hmm. or where or how. Now, one of the things that I understand from uh, reading your book is that uh, it's almost impossible to overdose on ayahuasca. Yes, people will vomit the medicine up. Mm -hmm. So the risk is the serotonin syndrome that I mentioned before, but people won't overdose and there's no addiction risk mm -hmm. either. No, we haven't really gone into the serotonin yeah. syndrome. Let's let's discuss well, that. Well, you know what's tricky <clears throat> about that is that one of the symptoms of serotonin is, is too much serotonin in the system. Mm -hmm. And this happens if you're you're taking antidepressants and you take ah, a, a psychedelic. Oh, yes. And this yeah. warning is good for all the psychedelics. Mm -hmm. But one of the risks one of the symptoms is that you vomit. Mm -hmm. So how would anybody in a, in a, in a ceremony mm -hmm. know, well, are you vomiting because it's the ayahuasca vomiting? Or are you vomiting because there's too much ser mm -hmm. you've oh, too much serotonin in your system? How would we differentiate? Well, it's very difficult. And, and let's talk about this. I know that we know very little about the actual biochemistry of uh, ayahuasca and, and other psychedelics, but my basic understanding for a long time has been what you reported in the book, that the uh, drug or medicine seems to replace serotonin uh, in the serotonin uh, receptors of the brain. Yes, you end up with more serotonin in your system mm -hmm. and in your gut as well. Yeah. That's part of the vomiting. Mm -hmm. And it's also part of people the next day feel great, yeah. usually. Um, and it's because they've gotten a real boost to their serotonin. Mm -hmm. And they, they, when they measure it, they find that that boost lasts for two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, the churches who drink this medicine as part of their sacrament, they often have ceremonies every two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. So they know in, in, how to keep this in, in the, the following system. Following the natural cycle. Right. It makes yeah. complete sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, serotonin normally is something of a, a neural inhibitor, as, as I recall. So when the drug uh, or medicine is replacing serotonin in the neural receptors, uh, that would suggest that the uh, nervous system itself is being disinhibited. I'm, I'm not... I don't, I don't have that level of expertise to answer that. Yeah. But what I can say is they have put... Um, Ayahuasca is similar enough to the other psychedelics that mm -hmm. I drew on research with psilocybin, mm -hmm. um, the the chemical and magic mushrooms, and they somehow managed to give people psilocybin and put them in a functional MRI machine. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, uh, the functional MRI shows less blood flow to what they call the default mode network. Oh. That is not an anatomical part of the brain. Mm -hmm. It's a neurological um, network that goes throughout the brain, and it it's res the the researcher in England said it pretty much is the system that supports our sense of ego, mm -hmm. our sense of self. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of running commentary inside of us. You know, when we're driving and we're just ruminating, mm -hmm. um, or we're driving ourselves crazy with self criticism. This default mode network accounts for about half of our inner monologue. Mm -hmm. And it supports our consensus reality, how we see things, um, how we're catastrophizing or ruminating, or I should have said, I could have done, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff is the default mode network. And what the psychedelics in general do is they quiet that. There's less oxygen to that neurological network. Mm -hmm. And so that quiets that down and that opens the possibility of other experiences, more mystical ones, mm -hmm. more healing experiences, mm -hmm. and also opens the possibility of new neurological connections mm -hmm. and, um, and, and regrowth of, mm -hmm. of neurological connections. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, they found that uh, after psilocybin, for instance, at the Hopkins research found that the variable openness was, um, and there was an increase in openness mm -hmm. that was when retested a year later, still was true. Mm -hmm. And openness is one of those five, the big five <laughs> personality variables that are not supposed to change in a lifetime. Mm. So now they're finding, wait a minute, it does change. It leads to more open, novel connections neurologically. I see. Well, that's very exciting uh, to me. Yes. 
And uh, you brought up the idea of mystical experiences, which have always been associated with psychedelics. And yes. of course, uh, we've been referring to ayahuasca as a sacrament, it, it, which it is officially, formally right. a, a sacrament. I think three different uh, church organizations uh, consider it a sacrament. Yes. But when we talk about mystical experience, there's also a, a tradition known as the dark night of the soul. People, right. uh, would, you, you could interpret that in a psychological sense and say, well, you're confronting your own shadow, but there may be more to it than that. Right, and some people experience that during a ceremony as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can come up in as many ways as there are human beings. Yeah. Uh, but from a shamanic point of view, some people experience that as a dismemberment, mm -hmm. that they uh, feel that their body is being disintegrated or torn apart yeah. in some way. Some people experience entering into the jaws of a, a snake, an mm -hmm. anaconda, yeah. um, or eaten by a jaguar. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of ways that people experience that dark night of the soul that sense of um, uh, terrible darkness and pain of, mm -hmm. of uh, being disconnected. And some scholars, as I recall, consider that a necessary prerequisite to becoming a shaman is, is to go through that experience. You know, I think it's an essential part of it. I think there's mm -hmm. no way around it. It inevitably it happens yeah. in everybody's spiritual journey, mm -hmm. and I think this is part of what the quote I gave you early on about Ann Shulgin saying therapists have to go through this, in order to be of any help to mm -hmm. someone else going through this difficult, challenging experience. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, be comfortable mm -hmm. enough with it ourselves. Now you have written about uh, having had what one might call a bad trip. Oh yeah, I would call it a bad trip. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much, yeah. but it was, and you know, I think a lot of bad trips are very <laughs> specific to the person. I mean, there are some that are generic, like the dismemberment and being eaten by a jaguar, but uh, the psychological bad trips are, are are like our worst nightmares. Mm -hmm. I think there have been some TV shows written about, you know, if you, if you understand someone's psychology, you know exactly how to torture them. Yeah. And that's kind of what a bad trip is. Mm -hmm. So I had a very paranoid bad trip where I really felt the shaman were out to get me. I mean, you know, when you're mm -hmm. under the influence and you feel that the people running the ceremony are intending to harm you, there is no safe place to go. There's nothing safe. Mm -hmm. I felt the helpers were out to get me. It was and 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 I'm I'm not a great warrior. I I think at some point I was so exhausted, feeling that I was going to die. I just said, <laughs> you know, that to hell with it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of collapsed onto a mattress that yeah. was conveniently nearby. I'm not a good fighter. Mm -hmm. The next morning I woke up and I looked so awful. I looked terrible. It was the opposite of most people wake up the next morning and feel really good. I looked like I'd been hit by a Mack truck. And, and the shaman and the helpers, they all took one look at me and they tried to help me. They did mm -hmm. energy healings. So the very people I thought were out to murder me the night before were trying to help me and heal me the next morning. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, that was what's called a corrective experience in psychotherapy. That it, it was the exact opposite of my paranoid assumption. Mm -hmm. and, and they really spent a lot of time with me the next morning trying to clear whatever had happened from my energetic system. Mm -hmm. so, so that, and you write about it in some detail, how that yeah. related to your childhood. And, oh, it always does. Uh -huh. And we always go back to childhood, absolutely. Well, if somebody has the experience of being, let's say, swallowed by an anaconda. That's, a, that's an archetype. I don't know how to relate that to childhood. Right. <laughs> that's an archetype. <laughs> that's a different level. And that's really important <laughs> that you contrast that. Mm -hmm. um, because a therapist needs to know, we needs to be able to discern the difference between a childhood trauma popping up in a ceremony, which is what mine was, right. and an archetype, mm -hmm. which is what being swallowed by an anaconda or eaten by a jaguar. Mm -hmm. That's an archetype, and it needs to be worked with in a slightly different way. We're talking, I think, at that level of a spiritual death and rebirth. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you don't want a therapist making a psychological issue out of that, right. which is sort of downgrading that experience. Mm -hmm. You want a psychologist to be able to recognize 
that's a, that's in the spiritual realm and we want to talk about it in that language which mm -hmm. is different from and what did your mother do to you <laughs> you know it's very different uh -huh. i was clearly in the childhood trauma yeah. realm they're both important they're both essential yeah and they both need to be worked with in mm -hmm. the weeks and months that follow mm -hmm. in terms of not just integration but ongoing psychotherapy but you need a therapist who can differentiate those two levels and work with them differently mm-hmm the uh, experience of uh, ayahuasca might be like uh, a dream, for example. And yes, the visions are very dreamlike. Mm -hmm. You know, they call it the television of the jungle. <laughs> yeah. So in a dream, yeah. it's not uncommon to confront monsters, demons, dragons, and the same thing would be true in a, a psychedelic or ayahuasca experience. Right, and some people are very prepared mm -hmm. and they jump into the snake's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that takes a certain kind of courage mm -hmm. and ability to navigate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, find your way around an altered state. Mm -hmm. Because in, in a dream reality, it's very often the case that the very thing that you fear, as soon as you confront it, it, be, it loses its scary aspect. Yes, right. In, in Tibetan training, this is called mm -hmm. feed the demons. Mm -hmm. um, and it changes everything. It absolutely does. It changes the whole context of of what is out to destroy you um, is is actually an ally. Yeah. I wasn't able to do that that night. Mm -hmm. I felt destroyed. Yeah. yeah. And you, one never knows in entering an experience how it's going to resolve itself. No, I think most people are nervous before an ayahuasca ceremony and this is this is why. Mm -hmm. This is why it can be it can be terrifying. Mhm. Mm and you've dealt with people who have had truly terrifying experiences. Well, you yourself. Yeah, there was one that was very uh, terrifying. And, and what I did in the ceremony, in my mind, this mm -hmm. was a visual, I didn't move because mm -hmm. I wasn't moving. Yeah. <laughs> at the, I couldn't move at the time. And that's typical <laughs> in, in my experiences as well. Everybody was kind of in their own little cocoon. Yes, this lying is not interactive. Or sitting up on the floor. No, you're, you're mm -hmm. yes, you do mm -hmm. your inner work. Yeah. So I was not moving. But in my vision, I ran in back of the shaman. Mm hmm where his whole lineage is behind him that supports him. Mm -hmm. These are generations mm -hmm. of shaman behind mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And I sought refuge in his lineage mm -hmm. when I was overwhelmed yeah. with uh, fear and trembling, basically. It was an existential fear and trembling, and I ran for refuge. Mm -hmm. And was very grateful to receive it. Yeah, yeah it changed everything. Mm -hmm. Now, have you in your... Um, many interviews encountered people who had a bad experience and are, were still years later disturbed uh, by it? No, because people worked through them. Mm -hmm. People had one way or another of dealing with it. So I didn't find one person who said I had a a, a bad trip, a terrible trip, and I was harmed by it. Mm -hmm. I never heard that. Yeah. I interviewed people who were harmed by the shaman, who were raped by a shaman. That's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But from their own inner experience, no. Yeah. People say it was very challenging, very difficult, and I learned so much. Mm -hmm. Now, in the uh, early days of uh, psychedelic use, there were instances of suicide. Uh, Art Linkletter, for example, you know, had a she, child. That's a misnomer, yeah. actually. I think she had taken acid six months before. Mm -hmm. It was quite a time before. Yeah. And she'd already had a history of psychiatric disturbances, which Linkletter didn't want to talk about. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. So, but you know, I read um, in the original research they were doing in Maryland, mm -hmm. where Stan Groff originally had yes. the... Had the um, the ward where they were using acid mm -hmm. with psychiatric inpatients. Yes. They would, they had, uh, of course they had, uh, th back then and even in the research protocols these days, they have a male and a female therapist mm -hmm. with everyone mm -hmm. taking any of the psychedelics. So that you're never so left alone. You're never alone mm -hmm. and, and you or have the archetype of a parents. You're never on, alone with a person of the opposite sex. And either. that's also true. Yeah. Or, or of any se mm -hmm. either sex, mm -hmm. same sex. But the next day, that person was also never left alone, mm -hmm. which I think is something that we in 
in this country need to pay more attention mm -hmm. to. In, in um, other words, give yourself time after the experience to process. Right, and if you're not completely together mm -hmm. when everybody else is, yeah. somebody should stay with you. Now we know this in that there are harm reduction tents at at um, you know at music festivals, music festivals, yeah. and and Burning Man, and yeah. and and the number one rule is. I will stay with you until you're totally okay. I will not leave you. There will always be somebody with you. If I have to mm -hmm. take a break, you're never going to be alone. Mm -hmm. So it's this enormous reassurance. In ayahuasca ceremonies, we have to be more sensitive to this. Mm -hmm. We have to be sure that nobody wanders off alone, that um, even after the ceremony is pretty much over, everybody, as, as one person put it, everybody's wheels are back on the runway. Everybody's mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So the opposite story is someone had carpooled to a uh, an ayahuasca ceremony, yeah. carpooled back home, Fr his friends dropped him off, he went in the house, and he called a taxi to take him to the ER. He was having a full-blown panic attack. Mm -hmm. And there was not someone, there was not the structure in the ceremony for someone to say, are you really okay? Are you ready to be alone? And someone to really stay with him. And I mm -hmm. think we have to do better taking yeah. care of each other. We have to build it into the system. I see. Well, that's a very good lesson. Yeah. That's a very good lesson. And I you know, trust that our viewers who are considering this experience will uh, keep that in mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Please. Safety is always a, a priority. Mm -hmm. Set and setting. Mm -hmm. We want the setting to be very safe. Well, Rachel Harris, I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Normally, I like to focus on more upbeat topics. But <laughs> <laughs> Label the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> this, this seemed crucial to me that yes. if we're going to uh, have a series of interviews uh, about ayahuasca, that we needed to include the shadow side. I agree. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.